Let's do this thing. Thanks. All right, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about getting to net zero, which you hear a lot about that in this industry now. You've heard it elsewhere for a long time. But we're going to show how we can use IoT and digital twins to help us along, OK? Let's see. Good, I've got a countdown timer. I've got about a 60-minute presentation, but we'll do it in 27. So you've already heard all about me. Uh, yeah, I just have a consultancy advisory stuff called Digital Insights. Did stuff at Ericsson. Had a blast inventing Lumata uh, at Hitachi. I lived in Japanese factories for a long time doing that stuff uh, and then building Azure IoT at Microsoft. A lot of you might use that technology. It was pretty cool building a global scale IoT platform. Uh, what's really cool is both of those platforms are in the leaders quadrant for Gartner's MQ. So that's kind of fun. And I used to drive submarines, uh, special ops subs and Trident subs with all the missiles. So that was kind of weird and fun. Um, so let's kind of dive right in. At a high level, I'm going to just give you a rehash because that's just what you need on connected intelligence. So IoT, analytics, the whole deal. I'm going to kind of walk my vision through there, and it's kind of a generic one. I'm not going to pimp any particular platform or technology. Talk about the imperative about getting to net zero, and then just kind of go through some use cases really quick of how we might pull together a lot of the different technologies for different areas, upstream, midstream, and downstream. And then we'll all go get a drink, I guess. So connected intelligence. You know, we have done so many science experiments with IoT over the last decade or more. You know, I know, I know you, as you've heard, it's been around forever. We've been doing SCADA and MTAM and a million other things. And you know what? We were talking to astronauts on the moon somehow and got telemetry from their spacesuits, amazingly. So it's not like we don't know how to do this. So I try to look at things from a perspective. Uh, it, it, do you know who Peter Drucker is? He is probably one of the top management gurus of the 20th century. People like him and Deming and others just transformed stuff. So I'm going to present a view of the whole thing based on this one sentence. And it's kind of a bastardized version of what he said. But you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage or improve it. Pretty simple stuff. The most successful companies in the world in the 20th century kind of rode that coattail of, of that kind of stuff. And when you think about that, you think, oh, IoT, I can, I, I can see how it connects. We, we use sensors to detect and measure things. In this case, we'll talk about emissions because we're going to get to net zero, right? But it could be anything. We're going to use networks to transport those me measurements somewhere because we can't always be on site. What's IoT replacing? It's replacing a guy with a clipboard or someone in a pickup truck or someone flying on a plane. We're just using sensors and the magical wireless networks. We just put a bunch of Legos together and Bob's your uncle. Digital twins. A digital twin is a data structure. And then we fill it with data. And that's how we model things. And we're going to model and manage that emission data with twins. And we'll model infrastructure and things like that. Of course, we're going to apply analytics of various types to identify and quantify those kind of emissions that are coming in that are hydrating those digital twins. And then, of course, we use automation in every industry. That's how we scale, right? And that's how we do a whole bunch of things really fast at scale for a lot of people, right? I always just say things like, you know, we're going to connect your things, collect the data, you're going to manage it, you're going to analyze it, and you better take an action. If you don't take an action, then all this other stuff was just for fun. It didn't make any difference, right? So let's dive in. I'm going to, like you've seen before, I'm going to walk you through again the whole IoT stack, a connected intelligence stack. You know, we've got sensors and actuators on things, on machines, environmental systems, physical objects. Sometimes they're embedded in it. Sometimes we're retrofitting lots of old stuff. When I think of industrial IoT, I think of retrofitting old stuff because people don't get rid of things really fast. That's why you had like a thousand IoT companies come out like, 10 years ago, and they told everybody, I need you to rip out all your giant equipment and put in this brand new stuff. And they're like, yeah, get out of my office. So anyway, if I go from left to right, you know, I've got my things. Maybe it's my physical twin, my actual thing. Let's not confuse devices with twins or things. They're different. Devices, you may have multiple devices with multiple associated sensors and actuators to represent the physical twin of what's going on out there. Then you sometimes have short-range connectivity. 
It could be I've got an edge gateway with serial ports talking to a PLC, you know, and it's wired. It could be, like lots of you, you might have some kind of health band or some other system that's using short range Bluetooth and using your smartphone as an edge gateway. Or it could be a legit edge gateway, right? Anyway, it could be wired or wireless. Edge computing, I know everybody thinks that's some magic mega trend or whatever, but actually it's just pragmatic. Sometimes, you know, I remember when I was, we launched Azure IoT and talking to someone on a factory floor of the biggest manufacturer in the United States, which is not that far from me in Seattle. And they said, man, this, this analytics and this IoT stuff and all the ML, this is great. Show me the version that runs right here on my factory floor. And you're like, uh, okay, we have a cloud way over there. Sometimes you can't wait, right? It's latency, it's data. So anyway, edge computing can do a lot of great things for you right there, data governance, things like that. Then you have long range connectivity, right? It could be MPLS, it could be fiber, your ethernet, it could be LoRaWAN, it could be cellular, it could be all kinds of things to get you to your destination, right? Um, and then, then you kind of get up to that cloud and I'm not obsessive about what the cloud is. It doesn't have to be one of those hyperscaler clouds. It can be somebody's data center. It could be Equinix. It could be all kinds of stuff, right? Anybody who's been an architect for a long time, the cloud was just meant the network. Um, so anyway, you build that system. It's user and data manager. You add users, you're registering devices, you're registering digital twins, you're storing data, you've got security, identity management. All that stuff is usually what you see in an IoT platform stack. And then, of course, we're going to add analytics to it because we need to derive insights from the data. Sometimes it's just really simple stuff. You'd be amazed how much bang for your buck you can get with just conditional branching logic. If this, then that, threshold stuff. I mean, that's pretty much what's going on in most factories. Streaming stuff, it doesn't... I always tell people we're scaring customers when we say AI and IoT in the same sentence because we have a lot of people believing we can only get value unless we have some kind of distributed neural network. And that's just crap. It's just not true. There's tons of value to be had with the simplest stuff, and you just need to, you need to do it. Um, and, then, and then outcome. The outcome is the only thing the customer cares about. All this other stuff is just plumbing. It's just blah, blah, blah. And so all the different things, I'm going to get an insight, and I might take an action. My digital twins of my industrial robots on my assembly line are telling me the machine's going to fail next Thursday. I'm going to send a route a message to SAP to create a trouble ticket. Let's go fix it before it fails. Visualization is great. It's also great just for sales. Real IoT at high scale, when we get to that vision that we all had for IoT, back when Al Gore and I invented IoT in the early 90s, we were imagining the whole planet just being run autonomously. There's no dashboards with that. You don't have Homer Simpson looking at some kind of control panel in a reactor. All right. It's all about the networks. Your previous session, the previous talk, talked about how important it is to pick that network first and get that right. Most IoT projects I've been on, they run into a brick wall, they paint themselves in corners all the time because they think connectivity is a commodity and they do everything else first. And then they try to bolt on the connectivity later. And a lot of times it bites them. You know, They'll start with Wi-Fi and then realize, oh, maybe I needed cellular or something like that. There is no shortage of ways to connect your stuff. And so you really need to be thoughtful about thinking about how you're gonna do it. So digital twins. Since this is the digital twin track, I'm sure you've already heard ad nauseum about like Dr. Michael Greaves, you know, coming up with that in 2002, the whole idea of digital twins. We've got digital twin prototypes, sometimes called a digital twin model. You'll inherit from that. It'll have all its properties and everything. You'll have digital twin instances. I have a digital twin prototype of a Ford F-150 from 2018, and then there's one million of instances on the road. And then you have digital twin aggregates, right? We can look across all twins of the same type, of the same model, and see how they're comparing. So here's a picture I've used when we're building Lumata. When I, you because know, I was, you know, you, you've, you've certainly heard about the German view of digital twins. The administrative asset shelf is a big thing. Uh, there's other views of digital twins. I was doing mine in Japan. And so we called them asset avatars and we thought about them the way we did things in Japan. Uh, and that, it was great, you know. Um, your physical thing over here, sensors, actuators. What's IoT? 
It's the plumbing. It's just the plumbing in between, right? Because you've got to hydrate the digital twin. It's got to stay alive, right? It's got to be fulfilled. So the digital twin is a data structure, and we are going to fill that data structure with data, and the twin will have all kinds of properties, attributes, things like that. Some are dynamic, some are because telemetry is coming, some are static. The car is 20 feet long. RPM is, is 6,000 RPM, oh, and now it's 10,000, you know, that kind of stuff. You apply your analytics to the twin, you know? And so you can put KPIs on every single one of the properties of the twin, uh, and then analytics to those. But this is where your APIs go. I just want to say I love APIs. I've heard that they're brittle, but I love them anyway. Um, so APIs, visualizations, apps, everything you're going to do, you're pointing at the twin. Why? Because we're not always going to go visit the physical thing. When you have a collection of twins of the same type, that's the digital twin aggregate that Dr. Greaves talks about. The digital thread. What's going help? What's, what's that whole loop? What's it doing over its life cycle? Remember, digital twins are designed for PLM, right? Um, so anyway, there's our little crash course there. Analytics, you got to apply some analytics to it. Get some actionable insights. You're going to point analytics tool at that latest state of the twin, right? You know, time series, right? Or you can look at the historical state over time of that digital thread. You know, and you can combine state across aggregates. So we have operational visibility. When you talk about your dashboard, hey, what happened? What's going on? You know, we have diagnostic stuff, determining root causes of problems. Why did it happen? We've got analytics that everyone talks about, predictive analytics. It's not as easy as everyone says. Um, fix it before it fails. That's the holy grail. We've been talking about this forever. Not very many people get it right. Um, I've worked with really smart people, and we've got ML to do predictive maintenance in the lab pretty well. Things get weird out in production, though. Out in the real world, there's too many weird variables that make the ML stuff not work the way you think it's going to. And then automation, prescriptive analytics. What should we do next? Does any of this look familiar? Did you ever visit a doctor because you're sick? Well, what's a doctor doing? They're looking at you. They're trying to figure out the root cause. And maybe they're going to do a prescription <laughs> to fix it. It's the same stuff. So don't overthink it. In fact, that's my motto with IoT. Just don't overthink it. Um, automation. Why do we do automation? We want to repeat things without human intervention, right? For a bunch of different reasons. There are jobs to be done. Have you ever heard of that whole philosophy? There's a whole management deal around jobs, the jobs to be done. In every business, there's jobs to be done. We hire people because there are tasks we need to accomplish. So anyway, think about those jobs to be done when you're thinking of your automation. What are the customer's needs to be met through those jobs? So why do we automate labor shortages? Can't get young people to work in factories. We can't get young people to work on farms anymore. I can't get pe young people to go work in the maritime industry on ships. It's kind of a problem, right? So automation. We get better throughput, we improve our quality because we're doing everything the same way exactly and it, there's no human error, right? Predictability is better when you do automation. Consistency is the same over and over again. Better accuracy. Do you know how many people still, do you see businesses today that people are out in the field with a pencil and paper still and they capture data and then they drive their pickup back to the office and then they transcribe what they wrote into SAP or something like that. I see it all the time. I, was, I used to be horrified by it, but now I'm just dumb because it's still there. You know, some people made the transition to typing something in a laptop, you know, or putting it on a smartphone. What is IoT? It's just the next evolution of that. A person is looking at something, discovering something with their eyes or senses, writing it down. IoT is just doing that stuff for you. It's not rocket science. Automation is the only way you're ever going to scale, though. For sure, so you gotta, you gotta do automation. All right, this whole net zero thing. The whole energy sector, you know, there's this whole global warming thing, things are getting toasty out there. I live out in the Western United States. We have fire season every year now. We didn't used to have that. Half the country's on fire every summer. We have drought. The water's gone in California. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff in agriculture. I'm watching crops just die. People are having to mow down their fields now. You know, here in Texas, everyone's selling off all their cattle as fast as they can before the cows die because there's not enough water. Yeah, it's a thing. It's real. So it's kind of all hands on deck. 
I know a lot of times people don't like to talk about this or it makes them uncomfortable. So just kind of go with what you see outside and let that be your guide. So how are we gonna transform the energy sector? Energy production, transportation, and consumption is three quarters of greenhouse gases. That's a big chunk. So you can imagine this is a great place to focus. So here we are today, right? Let's, let's aim some of this stuff at this problem here. So we gotta transform how we produce energy, how we transport it all around, and how we store it. And then I promised I wouldn't talk about the fourth one, which is how we consume it, because I'm not gonna tell you to buy a Tesla, because that probably wouldn't go over too well in Houston. So that's cool, right? So here's the crazy thing, to stay on track for this 2050 thing, apparently we have to have CO2 and methane down by 75% just by the end of this decade. That's a really tall order. IoT and digital twins and analytics and data and networks to the rescue, right? It's not the whole solution, but it's part of the solution. Back to Peter Drucker. Can't, you can't manage or improve something if you don't measure it. So let's start with measuring and then let's, let's see how we can improve it. You've probably all seen pictures like this. So what are we talking about? We're detecting, identifying emotion, emissions. What are these things? They're just leaks, right? They're leaks, they're flares, stuff like that. We use cameras, sensors. Some are right at the ground level. Some are physically attached. Some are airborne. Maybe they're drones. Maybe it's planes. Um, start with the easy stuff. I'm a big fan of just keep it simple. Visually scan for cracks. You know, the basic use case for IoT was you're just replacing people with inspection, right? The drone's inspecting it. The fixed camera's inspecting it. Computer vision's pretty cool and pretty easy now-ish. You know, get your little Python stuff there. Anyway, visually scan for cracks all the time, not just once a year or twice a year or at some interval, continuously. CO2, a lifetime somewhere between 300 and 1,000 years. This is what gets all the press. Everybody's talking about CO2. In fact, things are so bad now, they're saying it's not enough for us to stop it. We have to build machines that suck it out of the air, or we need to plant a trillion trees. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's getting crazy out there. So we gotta use infrared detectors, kind of like you see here, and there's all kinds of different tools you can use. Infrared detection of methane. Turns out methane's a heck of a lot worse than CO2. Doesn't hang around as long, so that's good, even though it's 80 times worse for trapping, you know, doing the greenhouse effect. And of course, using infrared detection of nitrous oxide. It's even worse, it's 300 times worse than CO2, uh, and it's gonna hang around 114 years. These are things that are happening all over the place in the oil and gas industry already. There's people have sensors all the time, but a lot of times some of them are fixed. Sometimes it's a person though, coming at a particular interval, they drive and they pick up and you know, once a week, once a quarter, once a whatever. The EPA actually dictates most of this stuff. The EPA tells you how often you got to visit something and take a reading, right? Let's, let's make continuous the new rule. So where do we have to go? What are the locations we need to go to quantify those emissions? And then we're gonna take actions because we got these fugitive emissions. I love that, fugitive emissions, that's funny. And we just gotta stop the leaks. How hard could it be, right? Well, I guess it's kind of hard. So let's just race through some, we're, I'm just gonna go through locations and just talk to you. Some of these things may seem obvious and others won't, but when I think of that whole intel connected intelligence stack, what, what might be, so when I'm out there drilling or fracking or something like that, I need some kind of connectivity out there. I could be in the middle of nowhere, but it looks like here, a lot of times, if I've got electricity, I might be able to have Wi-Fi. Or you, do you guys know Laura, Laura Wan? It's kind of like a low, you know, low bit rate data. Um, some places you get, you might have electricity, you might be able to run ethernet. You probably be doing edge computing here. Um, you know, satellite's expensive if you have to use it. If you have connectivity, you know. IoT is not always about the cloud. A whole lot of marketing people a long time ago told you the cloud was some integral part of IoT. It's absolutely not. It's just a location, just like the edge is just a location. You may need the cloud, but you may not. So if you're in the middle of nowhere in West Texas, maybe you do edge computing. Push those analytics down to the edge and do the compute. Luckily, we got you know Moore's Law that's hooking us up in a big way. And then of course, there's always that backhaul data. You're going to keep it, you're going to store and forward, you'll analyze it there, and then you'll backhaul it as appropriate with cellular or satellite. Offshore, model that whole rig. 
with digital twins. Um, you know, when we, my experience creating asset avatars and a platform to build those, their composable twins that we built at Itachi, um, and the way we did things, it was kind of like, I would say, like a Russian doll. Like we, you know, you, you think I've got the twin of my machine, but machine may have powerful subsystems that deserve their own twin. And so we might have a parent-child relationship between those subsystems and the machine itself. And then of course, a bunch of machines together may work together. If it's a factory, they may all work together in something we call an assembly line. Why call it just a group when the assembly line should be a twin unto itself, you know? Just like we heard earlier, how do you build a twin of a whole factory, right? That's kind of how we did it, where it just kind of like a, you know, you had peer relationships and you had parent-child relationships. So do that stuff with this offshore drilling rig. Model out that stuff. I know a lot of people are already doing that work. I want to make sure, I'm really clear about one thing though. I go to a lot of digital twin conferences where I speak at, and everybody shows me their 3D model of their offshore drilling rig. Or they show me the VR glasses of something. Those aren't the digital twin. Those are views of the digital twin. Digital twin is a data structure with data and data types and all kinds of stuff. You can create a picture from data, right? That's what it is. So don't, it's good not to confuse. You're going to run whatever Ethernet, Wi Fi, whatever you can get through there. Obviously, lots of heavy metal stuff make it hard for RF sometimes, just like we see in factories. You're going to be doing a heck of a lot of edge computing. You're already doing historians and stuff on those anyway. So push down those analytics and everything down to the edge and do that there. And then, of course, you may have, if you're lucky, you might have some undersea fiber and you might backhaul with cellular or satellite, rather, because you're too far out in the ocean. Tar sands, model that area where you're mining. Edge computing, because you're going to be probably out in the middle of Canada somewhere locally. You never know where you are. Uh, and do that there, backhaul with LoRa or cellular and satellite is the worst case scenario. Your friends, your pump jacks, modeling the jacks, the whole area, the downhold pumps, the subsystems that are making all those things work, probably going to be edge computing that you'll need to do there as well. You can't always assume there's a cloud or it just might be too expensive. You know, one thing that I've learned over being in this IoT space for a long time, and this might seem obvious to you, is in the end, economics trumps everything else. And so many ideas, so many things that we've done in IoT have failed. And it wasn't always because of a technical failure. Sometimes it was just too expensive. Or the POC seemed to be great, but at scale, it became unprofitable. Remember that whole thing, the ROI, like the reason you're doing all this? If the cost to make it is lower than what you're going to get back, then it wasn't worth doing. We keep running into that a lot in IoT. And so economics should be front and center when you're thinking about your solutions. Everybody talks about detecting flares with computer vision. Yeah, do it. Capture it, notify when it's happening, where it's happening, get that data back. Midstream, pipelines, we got lots of pipelines. Compressor stations, moving that stuff throughout. All that drought we have in California, we may need pipelines for water. Do anybody remember way back when, or you old enough remember when Enron was talking about piping water all over the country? I remember that. I guess that didn't happen. Analytics, it's a little weird with pipelines because they're so long and they're so remote, you know? You'll be daisy chaining networks along pipelines is what you'll find yourself doing to, to get it, right? Uh, and since it's out and about, you, you, might have to, you might have to daisy chain back and maybe you'll get to a cloud. You might, you might be able to put edge computing at compressor stations though. Things that are moving and outside my rule of thumb, again, that connectivity choice matters. If it's outside moving around, cellular is probably one of your best choices. Uh, if it's inside, please piggyback on some other network that's free. <laughs> um, so a tank, it's out and moving. So you're probably gonna, you're kinda, you might daisy chain along the length of the train with LoRa, potentially, or something else. And then you might have one gateway per train to funnel the data up maybe over cellular, right? and you'll compress the heck out of it and stuff like that. Ships, I used to live at sea on submarines and ships, and so they're big, honking, complex beasts, and so probably tough to model, just like an offshore rig and just like a, just like a refinery. So you're gonna model all those compartments, all the subsystems, 
things like that, and then you'll run Ethernet, Wi-Fi, things like that, probably through the inside of the ship. You will absolutely be doing edge computing there. Remember, edge computing doesn't have to be a little rugged PC. It could be a big rack of servers, could be a data center, you know, and you could probably have that on a ship. Trucks, outside moving around, right? So use cellular, right? You're gonna monitor the tanks and the interconnects. And you're gonna use cloud computing. When you see cellular outside moving around, yeah, you're probably gonna use cloud. You need something that's always up there that you can send telemetry to and take actions on for your backhaul. If you're underground in a salt dome or somewhere storing natural gas, that gets weird. You know, all, all the potential exit points is where you'll be monitoring for those emissions and you'll probably be using satellite or cellular depending on coverage. Oil terminals, monitoring tanks, all the interconnects in between, all those systems, probably doing edge computing out there at a tank farm. You'll have one network that's interconnecting all of them and then you'll have a different one that backhauls you somewhere else, right? We're almost done. It's almost time for drinks. Um, a refinery, model it, analyze it at the edge. A lot of, you know, the, the cool thing is when you have electricity, magic happens. <laughs> so whenever you think in your mind, if I'm at a place that has electricity, oh, my life just got a lot easier. I have more network choices because I have electricity and it's maybe in a localized place. You know, I spent a whole lot of time you probably don't think about industrial IoT on farms, but it's just another use case. And that is a heck of a lot harder than you might imagine than doing factories, because you have batteries and solar and things are out in the middle of nowhere and bad weather and things go to heck, you know? So anyway, and then when you make it to Bucky's and you're putting gas underneath the tanks, underneath here, you know, and you can't always count, you know, obviously service stations, gas stations, it could be mom and pop, it could be big things, you know, so you may have different, remember economics is gonna play a big role there, so how you're gonna do it. So you probably won't put that, you probably won't tell them, well, actually at a Bucky's, you probably could have put an Ed data center in there if you wanted to, but other places like that, you're gonna be backhauling it uh, back to a cloud. In the end, not only have I seen this in factories and in energy, and I see this in agriculture, it's still just gonna take people. We talk a good game about automation to make all this stuff happen automatically, right? You know, you know we wanna monitor all those systems that we modeled as twins. We're gonna model, you know, we're gonna monitor those greenhouse gases, and our system is gonna tell us what to do. Is it gonna be able to do it automatically? Maybe. If there's actuators that you can connect to, make no mistake, IoT projects are still consulting gigs. It's a consulting project. I know a lot of people, I know vendors have these ideas that it's some self-serve thing. That's not been my experience at all. Um, there is so much integration work that's required by professional services consulting, like automation to, to actuate something or if I'm on a farm and soil moisture is low and I need to turn on irrigation system, that doesn't just happen. So there is integration work that has to happen there. Um, and so when you can integrate and automate, you should. But I tell you, more times than not, it seems like we're living, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, what I see, and you'll still be notifying a person to go take that action a lot of times. But that's good. We don't want to get rid of people anytime soon because it turns out it's okay. So anyway, thank you. And now ask me anything, like any question you ever had about IoT, I will nail it, I promise. All right, what happens when a piece of equipment or system is too complex for a digital twin? For example, wear due to corrosion or aging due to vibrations? Oh, come on. <laughs> it's never too complex. I kind of told you at least my view of it, there's the parent-child relationship with really complex systems that could be a complex machine with lots of stuff. You can still do that. You can have peer-to-peer -peer relationships. The corrosion and stuff like that, well, that's why we got cameras. They're, that's the other part, the IoT part and the sensor part. It's looking at that corrosion. So you're, there's a lot of ways to look at all that data all from different angles at the same time. SCADA system in place, isn't it cheaper to connect emissions using existing, so, yeah, it is. So just do it. If you got it, do it. Don't do anything crazy. We don't need to create more science experiments. Anything else? Anyone? Bueller? All right.
Thank you so much for your time.